So I'm Nicolas Sorensen. I'm the CEO of Orexo, uh, an exciting Swedish pharmaceutical company, a little unique compared to many other companies that you listen to today, is that we are also a company with commercial operations and sales today. I'll come back to that a little later. So where are we right now? Orexo has a revenue of a little north of 600 million. The important part of that is coming out of our U.S. subsidiary where we're selling one of our pharmaceutical subsulfur treatment of opioid use disorder. That business, just looking at the pharma business, has an EBIT profitability of around 50%. So that generates close to 300 million Swedish kroner that we can then use to invest into both commercialization of new products, but more importantly, into the development of new pharmaceutical products like the Amorphox platform that we have a lot of focus on right now. And Amorphox is very shortly a nasal powder formulation, which we have proven time over time again, has a higher bioavailability than other nasal formulations. And even more importantly, it has a fantastic stability, whether we're using that on biologics or we, if we're using it on instable small molecules. Today our pipeline, we have three revenue generating pharmaceuticals. The lead one is Subsalt that we commercialize with our own subsidiary in the US, our own staff. And then we have two products, Abstral and Etwa, where we get some royalties, which is a nice contribution, but Rex is not really engaged into the commercialization of these. As a complement, we have entered into the digital health space, which I must admit has been a little of a challenge. So our big focus today is on the opioid, is on the uh, on the pharmaceuticals and to the development of new pharmaceuticals where we're using this nasal powder formulation called Amorphox to first generate our first product is OX124, uh, which is a nasal rescue medication. We have a very resembling product called OX125 with a different API called Nalmefine, which is ready to go into the next stage of development. And then we have an exciting opportunity with something we call OX640, which is an epinephrine nasal powder formulation, basically replacing the EpiPens that you know you need to use if you have allergic shocks. OXMPI is an NCE, NCE project that Orexo acquired several years ago and have then sold on to a Swedish company called Gesunta. So the big focus for us is on opioid use disorder. And, and for those of you who are not following that closely, uh, this is the number one killer among young people in the US. This is what most people die from if they are younger than 30 in the US. It killed uh, more than 100,000 people last year. So more than 100,000 people in the US died from opioid use disorder. And what is a little scary is that we're seeing the use of synthetic opioids like fentanyl has basically taken over the use of heroin or painkillers like oxycodone. Fentanyl is much more difficult to reverse. Uh, and last week when I were in the US, I heard some statistics that you re have registered in the US about 220,000 people who have overdosed. 110,000, around half of these, they will die. So about half of those who are registered by the healthcare, they will not survive with the existing overdose treatment alternatives. And this is what we have a lot of focus on with OX124, which is a stronger dose. It has shown in clinical trials to have a higher bioavailability than other products in the market today or the market leading products. And then we, on the, as, a, as a bottom, we have Subsol, which is a maintenance treatment, basically to keep people out of misuse. Uh, on top of that, we have added on a digital therapy we call Mudia, because we see a lot of the patients in the US have no access to, to patient support programs, to counseling, uh, to monitoring systems, and that's what we're trying to do with, with um, Mudia. So I, I would say opioid use disorder today is probably the most neglected and ignored disease that you have in the US with the biggest impact on society, on expe life expectancy. This the life expectancy impact of opioid, the overdose increase we've seen the last few years had actually more impact on the life expectancy in the US than COVID. So this is what we're talking about, a huge disease. Our next phase product is based on, on Amorphox. And, and the curve that you will see to the left is actually comparing head-to-head -head, our OX124 formulation with the market leader today in the market at the same dose. The one we're filing with in the US, or we filed last week, which is a huge accomplishment for Rexo, is actually a higher dose than what we have used in this study. But just using the same dose with this technology, head-to-head, -head, you can see we have a much ra more rapid uptake and much higher bioavailability. 
But what's equally important is the stability. So we're basically, we don't see any degradation. And we don't see that in our small, small molecules. We don't see that in our big molecules. We even tested this on the spike protein that you know from COVID, and we don't see any degradation despite having this in room temperatures. Uh, basically, the trick is that we have this powder where we capture the API in the middle of the powder, and that protects the, IP, uh, the API from degradation. We have tested Amorphox on a multiple different APIs, and as you can see on the data here, we on every single one of them we are seeing a very high stability, and we're doing that in high in accelerated conditions. That means that we're not keeping it in room storage or in freezing temperatures. We're keeping it at 40 degrees temperature at a 75% uh, humidity level. So this is quite challenging for a lot of these molecules. But when we're doing that, we don't see any degradation of the products. The focus for us is on nalmefene, naloxone, and epinephrine. And it's, it's a rare incident in Sweden that a Swedish company actually filed a product for approval in the US. We filed OX 124 earlier this year. We had some issue with manufacturing and the packaging line, so we had to refile, and we did that last week on Friday. So we now have OX 124 filed in the US with expected approval in somewhere between 12, 10 to, 12 to 13 months. This is a massive market, and unfortunately, a market that is underserved today because most of the people in the US who get these current treatment alternatives will not survive. So we need something that is more powerful, and that's what we're coming with OX124. Now that that has been filed, we're ready to move into our next product in the same, in the same line, which is OX125. Fortunately, most of the work we've done with OX124 is a one-to-one -one transferable over to OX125. But the same can be said about OX640. This is a much bigger market, and that's for epinephrine. So that's people who get an allergic shock, where we also have shown in the epinephrine that we can have a formulation that works both in high temperatures and in cold temperatures. And of course, if you're out skiing in the Swedish mountains in the winter, the likelihood that your EpiPen, if you have in your rucksack, will freeze is quite high, and then it will be destroyed. If you're at the beach in the summer at Mallorca, the likelihood that it will be exposed to high temperature, which would degrade epinephrine, is quite high. Having a formulation that can keep this stable, we mean is meaningful and important for the patients. And on top of that, a formulation that we know, and again, having studied in the first clinical trial, has a higher bioavailability than other alternatives in the market. Our financials, very short. We are in a fortunate situation, Orexo, in the sense that we have most of our revenues in dollars. Uh, our profitability in the US is in dollars. A lot of the expenses are in Swedish Krona, at least in the R&D part. So we have seen our net revenues where we have Subsol as the main driver. Subsol has been subject to generic competition from uh, one of the leading competitors since 2019 and after that we saw some of the large contracts we had with payers in the US we received competition we had exclusive contracts where we were the only one that the patients could get but from 2019 we saw the two major payers Humana and United Health Group opened up for generic alternatives that have cost us something on our revenues but we actually seen that flattening during this year and even some growth in US dollars quarter over quarter in the beginning of the year. So we have seen right now that our revenues in Swedish Krona is going up a little. It's based on a stable so, uh, development of subsalt at the moment. We're working very hard on our OPEX, so reducing our, our expenses. And what you should look at when you look at our EBIT and our EBITDA is that a lot of our money it has gone to a legal uh, patent litigation we had with Sun Pharmaceuticals. We won that one during the summer. So for 1st of July, uh, we could announce that we had won in the district court. Such a process is a cost somewhere about 100 to 150 million. And that's something we have been forced to take during the last few years. If we exclude those expenses, plus the expenses that were had for OX124 during this year, the company is actually profitable on an EBITDA level. In, in our second quarter, we were profitable uh, as a company could report that. Our expectations for this all, for the second half of the year is to have an EBITDA balance, so plus minus uh, zero, you can say. Just very final slide, I have 14 seconds I can see. We believe now when we're past the legal challenge, when we are 
over the most expensive last part of OX124, and when we are looking into partnering for our OX640, OX that we're in a position where we're quite close to profitability, in particular on EBITDA level. We, do, we can see that our subsoil sales have stabilized during the last quarters, so we see that this decline that we saw since 2019 is more or less over. Uh, we do see some progress in digital therapies. It's an area that is much harder to get reimbursed in the US than I and anyone in the business had anticipated when we started this. So we're working there, but it's with less and less resources because right now we're seeing that more like an option. We stay in the business, but keep our expenses as low as possible. And then we have our R&D pipeline where I think we will have some revenue generating partnerships relatively soon, in particular around OX640. So a lot of positive momentum and again a little noteworthy there's not many Swedish companies who actually file with the FDA and we just did that last Friday that was my last thank you thank you Nikolai do we have any questions from the audience you were saying that uh, a lot of the growth is driven by Subsol. What are the expectations going forward with Subsol? So actually, I, I think Subsol is, is very profitable. It's uh, generating around 600 million Swedish. It's, uh, our EB profitability is cl close to 50%. And Subsol, I see, has gone from g going down to actually being stable. But the growth is going to come from the launch of OX124. It's going to come from the partnership that we expect for OX640. But even the partnership around the technology and more for OX moving forward. Uh, so Subsol is a quite nice contribution. I think a lot of the companies here would like to have an annual contribution of about 250 million or close to 300 million actually coming in and not have to seek money on the stock exchange. That does sound nice, Kim. And uh, so you won, you won the case. So you're you're off the hook uh, with regards to uh, uh, to uh, to the litigation. So when does all of this trickle down uh, onwards through the EBITDA to the to the uh, to the profit after tax? <laughs> so, so the so the patent litigation. If you compare Q1 with Q2, our Q2 we had a positive EBITDA of six million. In Q1 we had a minus of, of quite a few million. I think it was 30 million something. Uh, Q1 was really the big expense driver was the district court. Q2, we had very little expenses for that. Then I would say that Sun, Sun Pharmaceuticals have appealed the decision. So we are still in, in a process. Uh, but I would say, having read through the, through the decision, that if there is such thing as a slam dunk in, in a patent litigation, that was our, our win during the summer. They basically didn't get any rights according to the court in that decision. So on none of their arguments for infringement, for invalidity, were supported by the court. So it's a big, big task for them to overturn this in the federal court, and, and we feel quite comfortable about that. But we have not finally won yet. That decision will come in the second half of next year. All right. Um, on on OX640, uh, uh, you're taking on a dragon with the EpiPen, uh, and you mentioned some of the uh, benefits of your products. How are you going to take on that battle, or how is a partner taking on that battle? No, I, I think, so, so we are not the only one with a nasal spray, but we believe we have the best nasal spray, in particular around the stability, but also we see the bioavailability appears to be better. We haven't done a head-to-head -head study, but just looking at reported data from the other companies with a nasal spray. When we saw that in, in overdose rescue medication, in 2015, a product called Narcan was launched, which is a nasal spray. Before that, it was only auto-injectors and injection of naloxone. Narcan basically took over the entire market within a year. And it also expanded the market because suddenly it's much easier to bring along. It's much less sensitive to have a small nasal spray than to carry around an auto-injector, which is much more sizable. A lot of the auto-injectors, they need to be room storage. So if you have the EpiPen, you, you literally you cannot take it to the beach. It should stay in room storage. It has very short shelf life. And I, I can just take a, s a small example. I, I were out hiking with my sister two weeks ago, and she told me that they had just been forced to call an ambulance for a husband who is multi-allergic because he was eating something that had something in it that he couldn't take. And she, of course, she ran out and tried to find the EpiPen that they have, but she saw that it's out of shelf life. 
So she didn't dare she, to inject it, because will she inject something that is out of shelf life? So she had to wait for the ambulance to come and give him the epinephrine. I think that's a story that most people who have been through this can relate to. And I think a lot of people who have this can relate to that their kids don't really want to carry around this big EpiPen when they're going to the soccer match. But looking at our nasal spray, that's very small. It can fit in most kids' pockets. So it's, it's something that you can carry around and you don't have to be scared that this is subject to heating or to freezing. For me, as a parent, that would be very important. So you're in, you're in partnering discussions. What's your ideal partner? I think our ideal partner is someone who is in the allergy space, some way or the other. So either you're working with uh, EpiPen today or similar products, there are other than EpiPen brands out there, uh, so that you know something about allergy. Uh, alternatively, you should be a larger company that has a pretty broad footprint, and, and we have some good interest in OX640, so knock on wood, so hopefully we can get this uh, one done during this autumn.